As we enter the final weeks of the 2021 Iowa legislative session, we sit down with a state leader helping to craft final agreements. Iowa Senate Majority Leader Jack Whitford on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating nearly 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, April 9 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. The final weeks of the Iowa legislature are often met with stormy weather and anxious lawmakers. Key bills and budgets are still floating through the State House chambers in mid-April as legislators eye adjournment in coming weeks. To discuss the current status in Des Moines, we're joined by Iowa Senate Majority Leader Jack Whitford of Ankeny. Senator, welcome back ha to the show. Happy to be here. Good to have you. Also joining us across the table is Lee Enterprises Des Moines Bureau Chief Aaron Murphy and Radio Iowa News Director Kay Henderson. Senator, on Thursday, the Iowa Supreme Court issued a ruling about how they intend to handle redistricting. It didn't have a lot of details. They said they would try to follow the state law to the extent possible. What's your reading of that document and what do you intend to do? Well, this is a really important issue because every 10 years we go through this redistricting process to where we set the districts, the state House, state Senate districts, congressional districts back to um, an equal size. Um, normally, we'd be about done with that in any normal year, but because the census data has been delayed, um, it has really um, made our process difficult, And um, meaning we need to have that done constitutionally by September 1st. The Biden administration has said we're not going to get that data needed to make those maps until the end of September, and so constitutionally, it makes it very difficult for us to do that. Um, the, the Supreme Court um, statement was a little vague, but how I read that is they, like almost everyone, agrees that Iowa has a fair and one of the best redistricting processes in the country, and they think we should use it. And so if it gets past that constitutional September 1st deadline, um, it, it sounds to me like they want us to, um, even if it's later than that date, use the current process as outlined in Chapter 42 of the Iowa Code. So you, the legislature would draw the maps and that would be it? Well, the normal process is the um, LSA, right. uh, the Legislative Service uh, um, Agency, would draw a map and then the legislature votes it up or down. They draw a second one, we vote it up or down and you can't amend it until the third one. That's the process that has been in place for about 50 years mm -hmm. and it seems to me um, that the court wants to try to use that process if at all possible. And, and that's what people across the country, redistricting has become very popular and people across the country say Iowa has one of the best, if not the best system, and so it makes sense to me that we should try to use that. Senator, as the uh, session winds down here, the focus starts turning towards the budget, and one of the departments that's got a little heightened interest right now is the Corrections Department budget after the unfortunate, the tragic incident at the prison in Anamosa where a couple uh, workers were killed. Uh, first, let me just ask you, do you believe that staffing in Anamosa and at the state's prison system as general, is it adequate or do we need more workers at those facilities? Well, first of all, that was a, an extremely tragic situation and those are two good public servants that um, unnecessarily lost their life and it's extremely tragic and we need to make sure that we do whatever we can to make sure our prisons are safe for those workers. Uh, we're going to continue to work with Director Skinner 
um, to make sure that um, our prisons are safe for our workers and provide the resources needed. And so those conversations are ongoing, um, but we want to work with her. She's the one that's the expert, um, not Danny Holman. Um, she's the one that knows what our prisons need, and that's who we want to listen to when it comes down to, to funding our, our corrections. And Danny Holman, for our viewers, is the leader of the union who has been saying uh, that, uh, that, that they believe that the prisons are understaffed. Um, but you've, you, you're saying that you would defer to Director Skinner on that. Yeah, I mean, she's the expert. She runs all of our prisons. Um, Iowa's prisons are looked at as, as a model institution that are run extremely well. Um, she is a great public servant, and she knows, and we're going to work with her to provide the resources that they need. And speaking of those resources, you've proposed, I think, a 4 or $5 million increase. The, the House Republicans uh, have proposed a $20 million increase. Um, where will that land and what will that money go Well, part to? of that discrepancy is we rolled out that number like the day after the incident happened. So that process of figuring out how much we, we need in addition if, if there are safety concerns um, has not been vetted. And so the House rolled their number out maybe two weeks later to where they had done a little bit more work. So um, obviously it's going to come somewhere in between there um, after talking with both the governor and the director of corrections. So there will be more money for the prisoners. Absolutely. The Senate has passed a repeal of the inheritance tax, speeding up income tax cuts that were planned back in 2018. Um, you've voted to get rid of the property tax obligation for county property owners in regards to the, uh, to the mental health system and have the state taxes cover all the costs of the mental health system. You've done some other tax um, items. Which one of those are a must do um, in your negotiations with the Iowa House. Well, you did a good job of laying out what we've been working on this year in regards to tax. But as I've, as I've said, as long as we're in the majority and as long as I'm leader, we're going to continue to try to reduce the tax burden in Iowa. And this year we have put forward several different bills. Eliminating the death tax is in the House right now. Um, uh, getting rid of the triggers is in the House. Uh, the switch from property tax to the state as far as paying for mental health is in the House right now. All those are important ideas. Um, but um, the governor, as well as the Senate, have said getting rid of the triggers is the most important thing that we can do. It, just we just so our sure viewers that. know, the triggers are thresholds that are built yeah. into the current law. So in the, that you can't cut taxes unless you may have a certain amount yeah, of state. So in the, in the 2018 tax reform bill, um, that everyone said was going to bankrupt the state, which was totally wrong. We have more revenue than we've ever had. Um, we put in place triggers that the next set of tax cuts would not happen until we hit certain revenue triggers. The last estimate that came out just a week or two ago from the Revenue Estimating Commission shows we're right on the verge of hitting those arbitrary triggers. And so for predictability purposes, um, instead of waiting to see if we might hit that trigger or not, we're so close, we believe, and the governor has said, that we should get rid of those triggers. So that is important. The other one that is really important to Senate Republicans is this concept of um, paying for mental health at the state level and not on the backs of property taxpayers. Most states across the country use state funds to pay for mental health. And we have a system that has locked in a mental health funding for over 20 years on property taxes. And Senate Republicans have now passed a bill to not only bring that, that um, uh, the property tax level down $100 million, but also increase funding for mental health. Um, that's something that we have campaigned on. We believe in it um, even before the pandemic. But mental health um, need has only increased since the pandemic. And so not only are we reducing property taxes, we're adding more money to our mental health system. So we believe that is a win-win for the people of Iowa. What's the likelihood this debate will last until 2022? You have some uncertainty about the strings that are attached to the federal pandemic money that was uh, passed by Congress in the American Relief Act. Um, are you expecting to resolve these tax issues this year, or might it be advantageous politically for Republicans to act on taxes next year in an election? Well, I never think about what would be politically better to wait another year on something. We want to reduce taxes, and I don't want to wait another year. I mean, I don't think Iowans want to wait another year. So um, whether it's an election year or not, um, I don't typically worry about that. We believe it's the right thing to do, and I believe this is the year to do it because especially when it comes to the state picking up a larger share of mental health and adding money, our state budget's in a really strong position right now, and next year it's gonna get tighter with increased costs coming. So this is the year um, when our budget's in a strong spot to do that. Can you do that without running afoul of this new federal stimulus requirement? You can't, states can't use 
the stimulus dollars just to backfill and cut local taxes. Yeah, and, and, and there are some people that are, that are making that argument. But number one, we're not going to let Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Joe Biden tell us what we can do with taxes in the state of Iowa. Number two, we're not using stimulus money to do that. We're using our state budget, state revenues that have a surplus to reduce those taxes. This has nothing to do with the federal money. Um, you make a good point, Kay, when it comes to the federal money. There are a lot of strings attached to that. Um, we're still trying to sort that out. Frankly, I don't think the people in Congress that voted on that even know what's in that bill yet. And so it's gonna take some time for us to sort through that. But the tax proposals we put forward have nothing to do with any federal money that has come forward. Uh, some of the governor's proposals and priorities that she uh, outlined at the beginning of the session are still up in the air in, in, in the legislature. Uh, funding for broadband, you've, you've passed a policy bill, but the funding is still uh, a question. Affordable child care and affordable housing, where, where do those issues stand as, as things are uh, kind of winding down now? Well, we're certainly working close with the governor on those priorities, and I expect to see some resolution on all of those. Uh, we have passed the broadband policy bill, which frankly is the more difficult part to get through. And now it's just deciding on um, what, what number of funding that we're going to produce. Um, still working on the housing bills, still working on the child care bills, but overall her priorities that she set out at the beginning of the session uh, are alive and well in the Iowa Senate. And you said you do expect those to, to come to some resolution, especially uh, in particular child care and housing bills? I do, yep. bills. Will every city in this state and in, in Iowa in this state get high speed, faster broadband? You guys have talked about broadband for a long time. We have, and we've been working on it a long time. It's not easy, but with increased technology, with increased funding, with increased focus on getting it done, uh, I think um, we're as close as we've ever been. It, and it does take time, and it does take resources, but with the focus from the federal government, with continued focus from, from Iowans here, um, we're, we're going to continue to offer as, as fast as the Internet um, to as many places in Iowa as possible. But it, it's... Uh, COVID um, really highlighted a lot of issues, and this is one of them, that you need good, solid broadband throughout the state, not just in the metro areas. You need it in every corner of the state, and um, that's what this is about, is trying to reach those areas that aren't financially feasible for companies to go to. That's why they need incentives in certain areas of the state. On Wednesday, Governor uh, Reynolds said that she would, by executive order, or hope to sign legislation to forbid so-called vaccine passports, which have been in the news. You and your colleague in the House, uh, Speaker Grassley, met with the governor on Thursday. Did you resolve this? Is she going to do an executive order, or are you going to take this up as a bill? Well, when it comes to, to, to vaccines, first of all, Iowa has made a tremendous amount of progress in, in Iowans getting vaccinated. We're up to about 23% of Iowans now that have been vaccinated, and I would encourage anyone that is able and willing to get vaccinated because the way for us to get back to normal is have a herd immunity and as many people vaccinated as possible. And for a year, that's what everyone has said, is we want to get back to normal. And vaccinations are a huge part of that. Um, but now that comes into the question, the vaccine passports. Um, now you're talking the government issuing some sort of piece of paper or smartphone app to prove that you've been vaccinated. That is not normal. That's not what we do in America. And so when you say we want to get back to normal, yes, we want people to get vaccinated. But no, we don't want to have this system where you have to show your government issued passport to go to a ball game, to go to a concert, to go shopping, to go to church. And that's what this is about. And so we haven't resolved what that looks like yet, but um, we want to get back to normal, which means a lot of vaccination, but not this new society where you need to show this government issued piece of paper. Have you, have you had a shot? Have you had I have shot? not had my vaccine yet. You're not old enough. Well, I mean, I am old enough, <laughs> but, you know, I've said since the beginning and maybe on this show in January that um, there are vulnerable populations in Iowa that I think need it first. And when it comes to my time and my turn, I will probably do so. OK, but let me ask you about this. There's a fault line over who's getting the shot. We're, we're seeing resistance from Republicans more so than Democrats <clears throat> over taking the shot. If you look at uh, the sort of the pattern of where uh, they've had covid cases, it's up there in northwest Iowa, heavily Republican area. What's your message to fellow Republicans who are nervous about getting 
uh, shots. Well, I'm certainly no doctor and I certainly don't study this, but what I just said is we want to get back to normal. And there's, there's a couple ways to get back to normal and that's herd immunity and people being vaccinated. And so the sooner we do that, the sooner we get back to normal, but not go so far that we're in this, this new society where you have to have this passport to, to just survive. To, to follow up on that real quick, so there's a difference between, uh, you know, a government mandate to, to, ha to carry some kind of card versus uh, what if a business, say, wants to require that uh, an employee have a vaccine before they're hired or an airline that wants to require passengers to have show proof of vaccine before they can travel. Are, is that okay or are you yeah, troubled I mean, by th that as those well? Those are all the details that we're working through right now and um, you know I agree with the governor that this is dangerous territory to, to have these passports but what that looks like, how it impacts different businesses and different people, those are the details that need to be worked out over the next few weeks. Another issue in the news, refugee children. Mm -hmm. Governor said she doesn't want to see him here. What do you say? Well, first of all, that's a federal issue that I haven't spent hardly any time working on. We're President so, Biden wants, <clears throat> is asking the states to yeah, and, make and, space. And we're so immersed in our state issues that I haven't had any conversations with anyone, frankly, about, about that issue. And so really it's not something that's been on our mind and I would trust the governor. If she says we don't have the capacity to handle that, um, I, I would trust her on that. Senator Whitford, last session, uh, in, in a pretty uh, remarkable moment uh, that both parties came together and passed uh, some police reforms and social justice legislation in, in the wake of, of the uh, death of a uh, Minnesota man um, who was in police custody at the time. Everybody uh, on both sides of the political aisle at that time said it was just the first step in the process. This session we've seen uh, legislation that supports law enforcement in myriad ways, but we haven't seen anything advance that, it, that would be classified as social justice or racial equity legislation. Why is th why has that not happened? What, where is that second step, I guess? Well, you are right that we are one of the first and maybe one of the only states that actually passed legislation in, in the heat of the moment last June um, amongst uh, a national conversation on social justice. And, and we did that in a bipartisan, I believe, unanimous way. Um, but And we're all for peaceful protest and, and having this conversation. But where our caucus has, has started to focus is, when you cross the line towards assaulting police officers and shining lasers to injure their eyes during the, the, these protests, that's something that we want to stop and need to stop. And so um, some of the issues that we put forward relate more to that this year than anything. You know, one thing that we campaigned on um, this last year was, yep, all for the conversation of peaceful protest, but we're going to back our blue. We made that promise to the voters of Iowa, and we have done that with several pieces of legislation this but year. But has that come at the expense of not addressing the other side of that equation? And I, I don't know if it's at the expense of that. Um, the, the bills that, that came to my desk through the committee process that our caucus wanted to work on um, generally slanted towards uh, back the blue, and we wanted to keep that promise that we made to voters. The legislature has the authority to pass resolutions that start the process of amending the state constitution. Earlier this year, the House passed an amendment um, that was abortion related. Um, this past week, the Senate passed the same um, proposed amendment, but she changed the language. Why? Um, well, th this issue goes back several years when the Supreme Court, basically out of thin air, created a right to an abortion in the state of Iowa. If you read our Constitution, that right is nowhere in there until the Supreme Court wrote it in there through, through their decision. And so this is just about, as, uh, uh, about unelected judges making law as it is abortion. Um, what we have passed last session was language that has been, te I mean, when you pass a constitutional amendment, it goes to the voters. And ultimately the voters are the ones to decide if the constitution gets changed. Uh, you need over 50% of the voters to support that for it to go into the constitution. And so anytime you're trying to develop a constitutional amendment, you want it to have the support of the voters so that it actually passes and goes to, uh, into the Constitution. The language that we passed last year was language that was tested, that did have support of Iowans, that we do believe would pass and go into the Constitution. The House at the beginning of this year changed that language. And so all we did was change it back to the language that uh, has been poll tested, that the pro-life community has brought to us. And so we've kept the language that pro-life advocates have wanted all along. Um, the House changed it beginning of the year. We just changed it back. Clarify the timing for our, our viewers on if the legislature passes uh, a constitutional amendment, abortion, for example, this session in 2021, 
uh, you have to pass it again after the 2022 election in the 2023 session, yep. right? And then it could go to the voters, presumably in the 2024 election. Is that? Yes, that's right. So this is just the first step of, of basically a three prong uh, approach. You have to pass it this session, next session, and then it goes to the voters. Uh, our kind of our Groundhog's Day question, the bottle bill that comes up every every session, every year we talk about it. Uh, there does seem to be a little more movement on that this year. Look, maybe the pandemic drove that discussion a little more uh, and talking about the state recycling program. Uh, is that going to be something that gets resolved this year or is that going to be I mean, one we'll be asking about next year It's probably a Groundhog answer too. from when I was on here in January, which is there's still a lot of ideas out there. And I've said... If there's 12 different ideas, there's not one, and you need one to make it law. And so I know a lot of legislators, a lot of interests on, on every side are working on this. Um, we haven't got a whole lot closer than we were in January, but um, in January, it was as far as we've ever been. So I would say this, there is still progress being made, but it will be difficult to wrap that up in the next three weeks. So we uh, can ask you about it next year? When yeah, we'll back probably be show. back. Okay. <laughs> the groundhog question. Um, <laughs> Senator, a lot of stimulus money coming out of Washington to state government, local governments, a lot of money, billions. How worried are you, if at all, that some of this money is going to get wasted or spent fraudulently? And if so, what, what is going to be done to make sure that this money is not uh, misspent? Well, first of all, I'm very proud that in Iowa, our budget is balanced. We do have a surplus and we're not one of the states that's just begging for federal money to come. And um, you raise a great point that that's a lot of money to spend appropriately without fraud, without wasting it. And so um, we've been working closely with the governor to um, set up some sort of process or um, tracking system to make sure that money is spent appropriately. The biggest concern I have um, from a budget standpoint is that's one time money. So any entity that gets that money, if they use that for something that creates an ongoing cost, they're going to have a huge cliff and a huge hole in their budget going forward. So um, the biggest thing is trying to use that money on, on things that are one time so that it doesn't get built into a future budget. Because we've seen that in the past, even here in Iowa, back in 08, 09, 10, where they used ongoing or one time federal money to plug ongoing expenses. And that doesn't work out in the long run. And we spent several years getting our budget balanced after that. So um, we do need to track that. We do need to keep very close um, account of that money. But we also need to make sure it's spent in an appropriate way, meaning one-time money for one-time expenses. The legislature is proposing sort of a status quo budget for the three public universities. Um, what about the concept of a tuition freeze as well? Yeah, that, that, that is, um, I would say that's the House proposal at this point. They rolled out a, a zero increase for regents and a tuition freeze. Uh, I believe in our budget we had eight or nine or ten million dollars for the regents, and so there is disagreement there, at least in our initial budget proposals. Um, I think it's difficult to give them zero new dollars and freeze tuition. They have to be able to fund their university somehow, but um, that, that proposal from the House was rolled out just yesterday or the day before. And so, like everything in the budget, we'll continue to talk with the House about that. Do you What's think a budget, uh, tuition freeze is a good idea? Well, I think it's certainly keeping the cost of higher education down is a great idea. I mean, everybody wants that, uh, not only the cost, but also the debt that comes along with it. And so um, the lower we can keep tuition, the better. And whether that's an actual freeze or working with the regions to keep it down, um, we'll, we'll have that conversation. What's the Republican problem with higher education in this state? I mean, you get <clears throat> angry about tuition, uh, let no, zero, no, zero increase in spending. What's, uh, what's the message Republicans are sending to Well, me state personally, I don't, I'm a big Cyclone fan. I'm, I love our universities. Um, uh, from a conservative base standpoint, one of the issues they have is the, um, is the pushing of liberal ideas through our college kids and preventing Republican or conservative ideas from even being considered or having a conversation on campuses. And that's why we have passed several measures over the last couple of years to just allow colleges to be what everyone says they want them to be, a free speech zone where kids can go to college, hear all ideas, and come out with their own mindset. Um, but that has not happened in a lot of places. And so we have passed free speech bills here in Iowa that said whether it's a liberal idea, a conservative idea, a good idea, or a bad idea, we should be able to have that open free speech on our campuses. And again, we're one of the first states. Uh, I think we created the model legislation for that that other states are doing. But really, it's just about having an open, honest, 
okay, conversation that, for kids. Now that you've done that, Senator, why still a starvation budget for our state universities? I just said our budget rolled out almost $10 million extra for our universities. So that's You'd a have house to ask that's... the Speaker, Speaker Grassley in the House on that. Another, another issue that conservatives have been concerned about is uh, free speech in social media companies, and the Senate Republicans have addressed that through legislation. Uh, the concern that some have expressed is that could have a, a negative impact on economic development. What, what's your kind of big picture view of that? Do you share that concern that these bills could share off? scare off companies that are thinking about coming to Iowa. I think I, I think these companies come to Iowa for a lot of reasons. You know, we have we have the land, we have good ener cheap energy, we have um, very few natural disasters. There's a lot of reasons these companies come to us, but there is a concern from our caucus on this censorship that's going on with with big tech companies. They want to um, they want to allow one side of the conversation, but ban or censor the other side, and and that's a problem. And when these companies are getting state dollars. Um, in tax incentives, giant tax incentives um, to come to our state. We just want, again, want an open, fair, honest conversation. Less Your current term ends um, in the next election. Do you intend to seek re-election to the Senate or some other that office? That is the plan, yes. Okay. To, to run for re-election yes. and not some higher office. Okay, just a few seconds left. Any effort underway to legalize marijuana, recreational marijuana? Uh, that will not happen this year. How about in the future? Illinois is doing it, New York's doing it. Uh, we typically don't follow the track that Illinois is going on anything, but you know this is one that obviously has got more popular. Um, I don't see it happening in the near term in the state of Iowa. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you. Thanks, Senator, for being here. Appreciate it. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Iowa Press at our regular times, 7.30 Friday night and noon on Sunday. For all of us here at Iowa PBS, I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.